Hi, welcome to The Recovery, episode one of the brand new series. And this week we're joined by the amazing, and I'm going to say it again, because she is amazing, Lily Allen. Hey, Hi. Lily, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm good today, yeah. Good. Like, good. yeah, I'm all right, yeah. Just kind of good to say that you're good, you get what I'm saying? Um, on this series, we talk about recovery from a number of things. It's just not about drink and drugs, it's recovery from just life in general, really. And it's about how we, we maintain that recovery. And I really think that you're an important person to talk to about recovery because you've recovered from so many things in your life. And I just think that your story is, is an amazing story and it's, an, it's a story of redemption and it's, it's brilliant. Oh, so, no, it's true, you know, and a lot of people, you know, don't, tell people what their true feelings towards them when you know they meet them and stuff and I just think that you're a wonderful person I just think that you're a very strong and brave person as well and I think that it, it that kind of is testament to you so let's start with the very beginning what was life like for you growing up hmm um life for me growing up was interesting I guess I mean everyone's interesting but um my my mum was really young when she had me. My mum was 17 when she had my sister. Um, she grew up in Portsmouth, like a very Catholic family, and sort of escaped that fold and came to London, went to university and met my dad when she was, I think, 21, 22, and then had me and got married pretty quickly. Um, and we lived in... Um, a little flat in Berry Place in Blooms Bloomsbury, do you know it? Like by the yeah. Museum. I used to live two roads along, yeah. Um, and it was like a very, how can I say it? Like sort of arty, clubby scene that we lived in. Yeah. And it was around the days of like the Wag Club and um, uh, Zanzibars and like all these sort of like famous uh, clubs and club nights. And my mum and dad were really very much a part of that. And I I remember your dad from Zanzibar. That's where I first actually met your dad at the Zanzibar. And then this really famous incident where he smashed the Zanzibar up. And it was like... Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, he was, in, he was in prison when uh, he got jailed for that. Yeah. And my mum was pregnant with me when that happened. So for the majority of my mum's pregnancy, my dad was in jail. I think he got out two weeks before I was born. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that... That was, I was, I was born into quite a sort of hedonistic scene that you would know more about than me, I think. <laughs> yeah, it kind of, you know, for me at that point in time, it was really, you hit the nail on the head, it was such a hedonistic scene. Uh, private club, members clubs, and that kind of drinking to excess culture was really at its highest level. You know, it, it was like the... the it was it was in to be in that in, to get into that state in those kind of premises, you know. Yeah, and I think it's quite similar to like this day and age in some ways, in that you know you we were under conservative rule and Margaret Thatcher was prime minister and the arts were really underfunded and so everyone kind of like really sort of stuck together and it was all about freedom of expression and pushing the boundaries and yeah it was like it was a crazy time and I don't really remember much of it i remember like actually my one of my earliest memories is like walking around our flat in bloomsbury and there must have been you know like a party going on in the living room and making um bagels and cream cheese and selling them for 50p to everybody <laughs> we had like we had like a drinks trolley and um and i would yeah did piled up with a trolley with bagels and just push them around and obviously no one was hungry <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the last thing you want after you yeah, right. <laughs> shoved half an ounce of cocaine in your face. It's a child coming up to you demanding 50p for a bagel. <laughs> so what, the thing about back then and the thing about it being so, you know, that whole factorism and then it, everyone, and you said that everyone was much closer together. The reason why is because when you wanted to express yourself, you needed to create a platform because we didn't have social media. So mm -hmm. the whole of the, like, you know, from Covent Garden down to Piccadilly Circus was the nucleus of London. That mm. area, Soho, 
you know, the West End was that platform. So everyone yeah. from the arts and everybody who wanted to be a part of that world went to that area for that yeah. reason. Whether it be illegal after hours drinking clubs or private members clubs, you know, we, we were living in oppressed times. So when we when we're oppressed, we what do we do? We act out the best yeah. way we can. And I kind of think that's where that creativity came from. Yeah. Um and, but anyway, it was, it, it was, it, I felt very, um, s s not, not protected because I, I was in quite a sort of vulnerable situation within all of that, you know, people were completely off their faces and, um, and I was a child, but at the same time, I did feel like, you know, part of this thing and, um, you know, the complex, you know, it was, um, Peabody housing that we lived in and um there were lots of different people that sort of like lived in the same buildings that would you know look after me and my mum would sort of you know not come home from work or be at some club and someone would take over from one of the child you know nannies yeah. or whatever they're called babysitters and so yeah there were lots of people looking after us like i remember do you remember nelly hooper like he used to be he used to be a babysitter of mine. Like he'd sort of turn up with his skateboard under one arm and in his Sex Pistols t-shirt. And like people like that were kind of left in charge of us a lot. I when mean, I was you know, there. you couldn't have been left in, more, in charge of more, but you couldn't have been left with more creative people if you tried. Do you know no. what I mean? Nellie Hooper went on to do Soul to Soul and so many more, so much more like worked with Bjork and everything else. Nellie, you know, He's still caretaker today. He's still a babysitter today in so many ways. <laughs> I love Nelly. I haven't seen him for a long time. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it was like an interesting um, little scene of people that I sort of grew up around. But it had, you know, it was amazing in some ways, but also quite confusing in others because um, everyone was so it's interesting and um uh i don't think it wasn't that people made a lot of money in those days it was more just that they were really cool mm -hmm. and um i felt even from a really early age and something that got worse as time went on that there was always someone sort of like more interesting over my shoulder if that makes sense mm -hmm. and that uh, i could only really hold someone's attention for a very short period of time before someone really famous and impressive came along and then you know the, the attention was gone so um yeah we lived there in bloomsbury for about four years and then my mum and dad broke up when i was four and i remember it really clearly i was, I was all like standing in the hallway my dad with his bags packed and um you know my mum and, and him saying that you know he was leaving and I really just thought then that, that like, I was like, does this mean we'll get another dad? You know, I didn't, no one had sort of explained that he was gonna sort of stay or supposed to stay and be my dad. Um, so yeah, that was my sort of main concern. Anyway, then he left. And uh, I guess we sort of plodded around there for a couple more years. And then we moved to a house in Shepherd's Bush. Mm -hmm. um, and and the world kind of changed from being this sort of like quite dingy Soho life to a slightly more um, sun-filled West London life. And we were like into the area, right? We were into the um, one nine two era of my life, <laughs> which was like this little brasserie um, on Kensington Park Road where. You know, my mom and like Paula Yates and all these sort of quite quite glamorous women who used to hang out on the weekend and they'd sit there drinking their white wine and us as kids kind of ran riot around West London, Portobello yeah. Market and um we we were like left to our own devices a lot as kids, you, you know. Lily, do you think that having a dad and a mum the way you did growing up in that moment that you had to compete? Do you think that at some point you because they were cool parents? They were like some of the coolest parents you could have had. And I just think that, do you think sometimes as kids growing up within that environment, you feel that you kind of have to carry on that coolness in a, in a, in a sense? Do you know what I mean? You have a lot to compete with. I don't know, because I mean, I actually can't really remember, when I think of my childhood, I don't see my mum and dad in it. Like they just yeah. weren't really around a lot. 
um, it was more about my friends and, um, you know, because we, you know, like my best friend is Makita Oliver, who's still my best friend to this day. And all of, and her, her cousin Phoebe and Phoebe's brother Theo is my brother's best friend. And we just like, we were like feral kids and we just yeah. like looked after each other, you know, like we really, I just I remember know. us sort of like pushing each other around the streets in shopping trolleys and like, part of me feels a little bit responsible because I consider I hang out with all of those, their mums, whether it be Andy, whether it be Nana, whether it be your dad, I hung out with all of these people. Yeah, well, it was you. Yeah, well, their kids were being pushed around. I was hijacking their parents, so I kind of feel a little bit awkward about that. <laughs> Just give yourself a break, Tony. <laughs> so, so, how, so, when was it that you first thought, okay, when did you get into drinking? When did you get into partying? In the sense of, okay, I, 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 this feels good. I want to, I want to do this more. Um. I don't even really know, you know. I mean, I, I went I went to, like, a boarding school by the time I got to, I guess, 11, because I'd done my, like, 11-plus common entrance, whatever you call it. And, um, well, first of all, like, before that, I went to, the cat, like, a girls' Catholic school, and I think that a lot of my problems came from there because I just felt like a bad person all the time yeah. um, because that's what Catholicism does to one, I think, especially if they come from, a, like, an unconventional, very... Um, outspoken socialist sort of valued uh, family like my own it was um, it was all about sex drugs and rock and roll so I was very ashamed of, of my background um, because those were the things that you know the Catholic school very much looked down on or what all the religion looked down on and um, you know I, I really remember like uh, lie, my mum lying on the forms and saying that I had my first communion and I hadn't and then when I go to um, to school and we'd have mass, uh, you we you're meant to once you've had your first communion or your confirmation, I can't even remember. You're you then allowed to dr drink the blood of Christ and eat the body, you know, the yeah. bread stuff. And um, and I came home from school once and I was like, Mom, you know, I feel like I'm I'm gonna definitely going to hell because I'm eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ. <laughs> and she just she just rolled her eyes and was just like, Oh, if you feel that guilty, then you're definitely Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there was that. And then I went to boarding school. And when I went to boarding school, I attached myself, and I think this is linked into my addiction, um, to the boys in the sixth form. And, um, and I very quickly what found myself like sneaking off to, you know, bushes to go and have cigarettes and um, on, we'd have Wednesday afternoons off and Saturday afternoons off and um, and then you know we'd do this thing called binging and um, we'd go to the local supermarket and get a load of white lightning and sit in the forest and um, and get absolutely hammered and yeah give people blowjobs and <laughs> yeah, it's part of growing up I mean, exactly I um, so and I and I def I don't know if I necessarily enjoyed the feeling of being drunk um but i definitely enjoyed the being in the presence of uh boy bigger boys yeah um and what that gave me and i, and I think i probably became addicted like, or codependent at, at that point because i started getting my value from attention of others uh -huh. um and that is something that has played out you know up until relatively recently really well, that's kind of, I can really relate to that because, you know, for me, at the young age of like being nine and ten, when I was kind of sexualized by someone, uh, and then suddenly that kind of changed my whole, the way I, I saw myself and the way that I valued myself. And I kind of thought that was my primary purpose all of a sudden because it was like, okay, wow, sex is a way forward of me valuing who I am and I can use this as a tool to move forward and it kind of that like you right up until this current day I'm dealing with that today and I'm mm. like 14 years clean nearly uh, and I'm still dealing with that 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 outcome of that because I never dealt with it before mm. and it kind of that childhood trauma stays with me and it's well at the time although I didn't think it was trauma and I kind of thought it was something that I was doing because I wanted to do it it kind of is trauma and it kind of stays with us. Yeah, for sure. And I just really remember that, like, it, it, spending time with other people, getting this attention from other people, occupied 
the you know most of my my brain power and my and my time like it was you know schoolwork just fell by the wayside and you know my life became unmanageable so to speak like i was i was all i was thinking about was the end of lessons and you know creeping off to some bush with one of the bigger boys to go and smoke fags and and, and drink booze yeah. so um yeah that became my my thing and then no, I left school, I got chucked out of school when I was 15, 14, 15. Um, it was before like we, before we pro like properly had mobile phones. It did exist, but they weren't like commonplace. And um, uh, it was the summer term at school, and Glastonbury was on and I ran away with three friends from school to Glastonbury on a Monday spent the whole week there and because my dad didn't have a mobile the school couldn't call my dad but we weren't even with my dad we were there on our own and then we left the festival got ourselves to castle Kerry station and then my dad came to pick us up from castle Kerry station as if we just arrived from school so um so yeah so we'd basically been at glastonbury for five days mm -hmm. and um and lied about it and then the school obviously uh once we were all back home and safe um expelled me so that was the end of school for me and um and then you know i started working in a flower shop i did you know i got my first proper boyfriend um and yeah i just i kind of like immersed myself in the sort of like london scene and i was way too young and i was hanging out at you know private members club clubs at the age of you know 15 16 and and i bedded myself into that scene for a good like four years five years until suddenly my career took off and then i was basically just doing the same thing but in hotel rooms all over the world i mean i i remember seeing the first time seeing like you on the cover of time out yeah that that, that uh prom dress and trainer look on on the cover of time out and it was just it was prior to carnival yeah, it was a yeah. carnival thing. That's right, and I and I remember seeing it, and I was like thinking, "Oh my God, that's Keith's daughter." Blah blah blah, as, as my thinking would have been. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember just thinking, "Wow, she's grown up so quickly." Do you yeah. know, gone from that child into this woman. Yeah, don't know if I was quite a woman at that point, you but very, yeah, I was. I was, you, were, I was you, were, you you were a cool woman. You were on the covers of magazines, and it was like, you know. You you suddenly got this success, mm. you know, from, which was you know. How did you handle that? Uh, whew, um, that's a big question. But I mean, not not very well. <laughs> it was really confusing, you know. I mean, I think I do. I still sort of like maintain that I'm just really lucky that I was a good songwriter because. It justified it all but you know I do I still feel like I would have become like a famous person no matter what because I I needed I needed to be seen you know mm -hmm. like I'd spent my whole life kind of just like being part of this scene of really impressive people and um, and everyone else being prioritized over me you know That's and I think that you know both my parents almost like made a sac you know the sacrifice of like yeah. really being parents because they you know had like important things to do in the world and as a kid you know sorry someone's fixing my oven um as a kid that was really difficult um dynamic to kind of get my head around and i think that i think that also my parents were well, not my mum but maybe my dad um was like pissed off that they kind of you know given me the short straw as a kid yeah. and then like against all odds i'd kind of like gone fuck off and done even better than them and, th and i think like you know perhaps they might even have been like you know this isn't isn't fair you know we kind of like didn't give you the childhood that you deserve because mm -hmm. and and we sort of expected you to fail as as a result and yet here you are having exceeded all of our expectations and um uh you know all i wanted was like affirmation and um 
and praise and I didn't even really get it then. I got it from strangers, but I didn't really get it from the people that I wanted it from. In fact, I was kind of met with a bit of resentment from those people. So, um, you know, taking responsibility for my own actions, you know, I definitely no, like buried my head in drugs and alcohol, but also I think that I was just really sad. I was really sad. Do you, do you, you know, can you imagine, because you know, at one point, your dad Keith was really famous in the sense of he was in the comic strip, he was an actor. He was Keith Allen, always in the tabloids. And then suddenly his daughter comes along and takes that, that, that Allen threshold and name and turns it into something totally different. You know, he's going to feel resentful because he's, yeah. he's no longer got that fame. And suddenly, you know, the one that he didn't give the time of day to as such kind of just blossomed into something she shouldn't have. And that's, I think that's, that's amazing for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a typical... It's I mean, a, listen, I, you know, I, I love my dad dearly. Like, he's, you know, he... I don't, I don't want to, like... No, I love your dad. I don't want to, like, bad mouth him and say, like, ha-ha, you know, I did better than you. But I can understand that the... That, that, that it was weird for everyone to deal with. And also, you know, I wasn't like, it wasn't like I was an all singing, all dancing kid. So yeah. it really, like, fucking came out of nowhere. And I remember lots of my friends would be like, we didn't even know you were a singer. Like I didn't, I didn't talk about it to anyone. I just kind of very much went, oh, was like sort of working away on this thing on my own, like developing my songwriting. And I'd go up to Manchester for weeks at a time and work on demos. And, um, and then I started putting them up on MySpace and it just flew. And people were just like, what? Like, she's just like the girl, like in the kitchen at four o'clock in the morning, like whining yeah. on about whatever. And yet, and here she is on the cover of all these magazines. So it was, I think it was like bittersweet in a way because you know inside I was like ha ha fuck you all but also like I kind of was like oh didn't didn't you see didn't you see me before like didn't you see that I was a, a special person or whatever do you think that 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 fame that instant fame and, and and that lack of respect from the area that you really wanted it kind of pushes you towards another fuck it, the fuck it button in other areas yeah, for sure. And also, let's not beat around the bush. Like, you know, the celebrity world or... In fact, we don't really like the word celebrity, but, like, the creative world yeah. can be really fucking bitchy. You know, people oh. are, like, oh. very <laughs> judgmental. And, <laughs> um, and especially, you know, me having all of this success and nobody really expecting it, No, it wasn't, like, anticipated. It wasn't like people would... You know, I had you know, two, two and a half thousand people queuing up around the block outside the Notting Hill Arts Club, my first ever gig. Insane. Like, ever. Insane. And, um, yeah, people were really just like, what the flying actual fuck, I've worked you know? And not life. everyone reacted yeah, to it like, oh, isn't that. this great? Yeah. Um, a lot of people were like, who the fuck does she think she is? Like, exactly. Coming yeah. into the I've been doing this years and she, how dare she come along? Yeah. yeah. There's some talent come along and take, take away from your non-talent. Yeah, I that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so literally from that, you know, the pressures of that fame takes you to like, you know, I know for myself, all my, you know, all my friends were like the most famous people in the world at one point, and I wasn't. And so I had to find my own platform. And when I found my platform and found something that I was good at, which was probably bitching primarily, and secondly, DJ, you know, I kind of, it propelled me, it's something I was flying all over the world. But my, my insecurities and, and my trauma that I'd had from before wouldn't allow me to enjoy it. I, I, I lived in a world where I thought I didn't deserve it. I kind of, that imposter syndrome seeped in and made me eternally destroy everything. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't ready for that kind of success. I didn't deserve that success. Other people were far better than me. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I and I definitely can relate to that. Like I've I've felt that very much, but also I had like the newspapers telling me that on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, you're too fat. You can't sing. Um, you're plain Jane. All you do is fall out of nightclubs. And of course, you know when you're waking up to that news every day, you just want to escape it. And I just you I very much you know use drugs and alcohol as a means of escaping escaping that feeling and then you buy into what they're saying because you know you're giving them that, that that you're giving them the power because you're doing exactly what they say you're doing do you have yeah. to deal with it you know yeah. they, they, it happens with so many people so many people we've had on this series have said exactly the same thing like meg was one of them you know she was on the tabloids every day of the week yeah saying this and saying this about saying that about her 
And, you know, and that pressure is immense because, you know, we live in a world where people believe that rubbish. Yeah. They want to believe that rubbish because it makes their lives better by believing yeah. that rubbish. Oh, look at the state of her, you know. And it, 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 it must have been torture. Yeah, it was, it was sort of slightly torturous, but also, you know, I think that I felt really worthless and drugs and alcohol made me feel the opposite, you know, so I, I, would, I would spend my days like beating myself up and believing all of this stuff that was being written about me. And then I would like spend my nights proving it wrong in a hotel room with five other addicts, you know, like yeah, right. <laughs> putting the world to rights. Um, and that felt good in the moment until six o'clock in the morning when I had to get on a plane to Tokyo or wherever. And, um, and it was like, pack your bags and get out the door and start it all over again. So yeah, it was definitely a whirlwind craziness. Yeah, I mean, when did it go really sour? Um, I think basically after I got, I got married when I was 24 and um, then I had a baby. I had a baby who died actually 10 years ago this month. Um, and then, and then I went on to have two successful pregnancies and, and my babies. And then about six months after my young, my youngest was born, we sort of ran out of money and I had to go back out on the road again, but I was like 14 stone and, um, and just did, did not feel like a pop star at all. Yeah. And so I started taking this drug called Adderall, which is like speed and, um, to, to lose the weight. And then I got addicted to this drug it made me sort of like invincible and I could work really long hours and be all of the different people that I was required to be at the time uh and then I ended up on tour in America supporting Miley Cyrus <coughs> and um you know it was when she was doing like Wrecking Ball and yeah the Bangers tour and it was very like highly sexualized tour and um and, you know, I just sort of spent the last three years pushing babies out. I couldn't have been like less what I felt like. Uh -huh. And also I'd never ever supported anyone. So I was sort of like re-entering this sort of phase of being a pop star again, but not doing it on my terms anymore. Mm -hmm. so I, was, I was supporting this girl that was much younger and more attractive and, um, than I felt. And, um, and I just started acting out in all manner of ways. You know, I started like s cheating on my husband and, um, you know, I had always really drunk alcohol to take the edge off of the drugs. Yeah. And then I, I realized that I was getting up in the morning and just going straight to the mini bar and downing those little mini vodka bottles or whiskey, whatever was left. And, um, and without the drugs anymore. And I was like, Oh, I think I've got a drinking problem. And I, and I remember being in LA, and thinking just like none of this acting out is working anymore. Maybe I should try heroin. And, um, and that's it. That's <laughs> simple as that, isn't it? Just popped into your head. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to try that today. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane how this disease works because it will just put this idea into your head so quickly. And yeah. you think, oh, that's quite a good idea, actually. Yeah. So, but, you know, because I'd been in a scene where seen what happens to um you know people that use heroin and knew that it, when that thought popped into my head it was time to um you know confront whatever it was that yeah. confront my demons and um and then and that was about five years ago and um and i started recovery you know i started going to the rooms yeah and i and i did my 90 meetings in 90 days and I got clean um, and I just, at that time, I wasn't really committed to the program in terms of a lifelong thing. I was just like, I just want to get to six months. Once I'm there, like, I, at least I know that I can stop this when I, when I need to. And then um, at six months, I started drinking again and almost instantly, I lost everything. I lost my marriage. I lost my house that I'd worked for 10 years to, you know, to buy. Um, my career started just sinking. Um, and uh, I lost all my friends. Like, no, I, I don't, didn't have any of my friendships anymore. I was so resentful, so angry all the time. Really felt like the world owed me stuff and I uh, wasn't, um, you know, I got sort of the raw end of the deal. Um, and yeah, and that went on for another four years. Yeah. 
um, and then I ended up back in the rooms again. Which is where I, this is the bit I've been waiting for because this is the bit I love you for. I love, I love New Lily. I love, <laughs> I love this Lily so much because you kind of, the reason it didn't work before is because you weren't ready. And that's, yeah. when we're not ready, we do stuff just to tick boxes. We do stuff because we feel obliged to or, you know, okay, well, I'll give it a go, but I'm not really in it. But this time, you're so in it and that, that, you know, I joke about posh Lily, this Lily, that Lily, because it's so many factors to you that just make my, all my hair stand on end. And they oh. really do, because I've just watched you, since you've come in to the rooms this time, I've just watched you grow into this most incredible person. That, you know, that when I see you, I don't see doubt anymore. I don't see that, oh, insecurity of who, who you are. Because I mean, I've been on trains with you. I went to Paris and you were on the train when we began to Paris behind me for Kim's show that time. And, and I remember sitting there thinking, oh, bless her, she's a little bit like, uh, a little bit lost. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. I remember, you know, being Tony the judgmental old queen that I am. But you know, it was kind of just, and I'd seen that pain in your eyes. Yeah. And that pain is gone. Yeah. That pain really is gone. This new Lily is incredible. So what do you think this time has, has changed? Um, I think I've just sort of, you know, so it's, a, it's surrender, you know, more than anything and acceptance and, um, and gratitude, you know, I, I really, I, I mean, I, I'm not great <clears throat> at my step works and at the moment I haven't got a sponsor and, um, but I do do my gratitude every day. Uh -huh. You know, I get up in the morning and I do my gratitude list and I try and do my gratitude list before I go to bed as well every night. And I feel like that really keeps me in check and as well as meetings, you know, yeah. going to meetings regularly. Um, and um, yeah, I've just sort of come to a place of like accepting that I can't, um, I can't really get involved with all of that stuff anymore. <laughs> you said the magic word, acceptance. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and you can see that you have acceptance and you, and I know that you, the gratitude in you shines because where every time I see you, I just look at you and I just think, oh, wow. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and, and that doesn't happen with a lot of people for me are, I've got, you know, newcomers, yeah, and people that just come in and then they kind of disappear. But with you, I see you, I saw you the other, like the week before last, but I just, I was like, oh, wow, look at her, how shining she is. Do you know what I mean? There's this like, whole new aura around your confidence and it's amazing to see and you know yeah. you're remarried and you know i've never seen you so happy it's incredible yeah it's really great I and mean, i think more than anything you know i feel like i've you know or at least in the process of breaking that cycle you know and i've, I've felt so guilty about neglecting my kids you know in those early years of their life and having to go off on tour and misbehaving in the way that i was and um you know, I really like have a great relationship with my kids now. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm there to pick them up at the school gates whenever I can be. And I'm up dropping them off in the morning and I'll make them dinner. And, you know, they come to me when they've got problems. And that's like, that's golden for me. Like, I just, I just feel well, like, you know, they're like confident little, little girls. And I don't feel like, you know, well, touch wood, they're not gonna, you know, turn into a <laughs> drug addicts like I did. <laughs> but um, but you know, they seem like they're on a good path. And um, and yeah, I'm in a really happy relationship, really healthy relationship. He's sober and has been sober for, you know, 20 years now. And, um, you know, we're thinking about, you know, what we're gonna do with the rest of our lives. And, and also I just feel like a sense of, you know, I felt like I really had to like prove people wrong in the past and, um, and that people had all these are sort of like, I was very self-obsessed and narcissistic and that felt like everyone had these sort of preconceptions of who I was and I had to like yeah. prove them wrong all the time. Whereas now it's just like, you know what? I get to wake up in the morning and interact with my children and them feel loved and protected. And then I can go off and I can do my work you know, it doesn't have to be like a number one single. It's not a failure if it isn't a number one single. Like, I'm just lucky that I get to be able to do this. And um, and I get sent the odd designer handbag every, every <laughs> couple of months. You know, life is good. Um, I think and, and it hasn't always felt like that. Even though from the outside, people would say like, 
you're, you're, you've got loads of money and you're really successful, what have you got to complain about? Or I had everything to complain about because I felt so fucking miserable. Yeah. Um, and, and now I, I don't have as much as I had then in terms of success and wealth, um, but I have success and health in my head, which is more valuable, I think. And you know what? You have success and recovery and that you're, that's the number one single all around the world in my eyes. Do you get what I mean? When we get recovery and we accept recovery, we find that acceptance and we realize that we are enough. Yeah. We are enough. Today is enough. And you know, because of your career and all of our careers and the stuff that we do, we're going to continue to strive in that, in those areas. Cause that's our jobs. Mm. It's not about, Oh, she has an alley here now or he hasn't, he's not DJing there or blah, 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 all that, that rubbish that we buy into. When we realize that we're enough, our, what we've got, our, I look at, if I wake up in the morning and I look at what I've got instead of what I haven't, I'm going to have a really, really fucking good day. Yeah. You know I mean? If I wake up in the opposite head of, oh God, I, why am I not doing this? Why am I not that? I, I'm going to fail. That's going to be a really bad day. But you know what? The tools of this program kick in and I can change that. Instead of being why me, why this, why that, it turns into how. How can yeah. I change this? How can I have a better day? And you know, it's the simple tools. And you know, Lily, for me, I am so, so grateful uh, that you're in recovery. I'm so, so blown away by your recovery and, and how it oozes from you. And I've seen you with people that have just come in. I've seen you with people that are struggling. And that is a beautiful thing to see because I've seen you reach out to these women that have come in that really need help and really need a shoulder and really need to to be able to trust another woman and you're there and it's, it's incredible and I, I think you're amazing for that that's amazing thank you, you. <laughs> it's so true and you know long may you reign in this within this and and i just wish that you get everything that you wish for oh thank you tony I hope you, you, deserve deserve it. It. you deserve it and that's it that's the recovery that's the recovery. Keep coming back. Now I've got hair standing on end again. <laughs> I love you. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for telling your story. It's amazing. It's an absolute pleasure. Anytime. God bless. I'll see you later.